Well, halfway through the list, point number nine, Israelite perspective. Now, here I have to admit, after number eight, where I talk about the mendacious tact or lying tact of the Gentiles in denying to their Noah figure any role in the origin of nations, I have to admit that God the Holy Spirit in inspiring scripture in the book of Genesis practices a tact of his own. Uh, obviously, this text is very, very condensed, very, very brief for the sweep that it covers. And it is not only brief and condensed, but it also... Uh, has its own strategy of suppression that we have to reverence, those of us who believe in biblical inerrancy and in the inspiration of scripture for the benefit of man and for the truth of God. But there is a suppressive factor in it. And so the text reads, Note that despite acknowledging the reality of the universal family, the book of Genesis practices a tact of its own in suppressing the glory of this family in order to humble the pride of the Gentiles and divert attention toward the subsequent history of the patriarchs of Israel. That's a thematic attack in order to divert attention from the Gentiles to the, to the Jews. And the reason why it's righteous and right to do this is because of the very sinfulness of the Gentiles. They don't deserve, because of what they did, to have greater exposure in the word of God than they get at this point. They don't deserve it because if we showed all the aspects of their glory, uh, this would uh, create an impression that would mislead the reader of the Bible with regard to the salvation strategy that goes, obviously, you know, salvation is of the Jews, not the Gentiles. So there's a great thematic reason for it. So the real uh, burden of proof is on me to show why I think that there is a suppressed glory. Obviously, uh, if you don't, don't see it in the text, where is it? And where you see it is in the logic of the text. That is, if you put it all together, if you reconstruct what was going on, then you see how glorious and magnificent this Gentile enterprise was after the flood. Then you see this aristocracy. Then you see all of this. But you have to admit that in the way it's presented, it's made to look pretty earthy and pretty, uh, pretty contemptuous. Uh, the, the story of the sin of Ham, Genesis 9, the story of the Tower of Babel, and just the brevity of the way that Genesis 10 is handled, all of that is uh, definitely contemptuous toward the Gentile glory, and God, in his glory, which is so much greater, has a perfect right to be contemptuous of the glory of the Gentiles. Tenth point, synthetic history, and this would arise out of the ninth point, that if the scriptures themselves are very, very condensed, even to the point of dismissing uh, grand enterprise uh, with a certain degree of silent contempt, then you have to do some reconstruction. Labor to reconstruct early post-Diluvian history by applying the logic of Genesis 9-11, so you're getting the overall logical uh, source from the scriptures, from, from divine inspiration for working with the material. So apply the logic of Genesis 9 through 11 to Sumerology, and that's not all, the Egyptians as well, but primarily Sumerology, integrating such events as the Eric Arata War into a political context established by the flood, sin of Ham, Tower of Babel, and division of the earth. I pick the Eric Arata War because in my judgment that is the most important single event not recorded in scripture and it's kind of the next step. It's an immediate sequel, an almost immediate sequel to the Tower of Babel incident. My view is the Tower of Babel incident occurred 150 years after the flood. Uh, following that event, the nations were not dispersed completely and totally over the Earth's surface immediately. In fact, there was a conservative regime, for that regime lasting from the, 200 and, from the 180th to the 210th years after the flood and dominated by the patriarch Peleg. I misspoke yesterday. In reading of the patriarch Peleg, the d divider patriarch, whose name is associated with the division of the Earth because at this point, world population was large enough to start dividing up different portions of the Middle East and beyond. But at the end of the 180th year, the, again, I continued to misspeak yesterday, the swing over from the conservative Noahite faction to the rebel Hamite faction occurred in the 210th year rather than the 180th year. And they the result was a division of the earth into two camps, one living in Mesopotamia, the other one living in, in Iran, and one city-state within Mesopotamia at that time was Erech. One city-state in the Iranian world was Arata, somewhere in Iran, I think it may be at the point of Isfahan, modern Isfahan. And there was a, bat a war between two halves of the world, 
And this war set the stage for the rise of the Akkadian Empire and the systematic dispersion of the defeated people into different parts of the world. And primarily you're looking at the Austronesian linguistic stock, that is the language that was highly characteristic of the Iranian half who were defeated in the Arakarata War was Austronesian. And therefore that far-flung body of Austronesian speakers all the way from the island of Malagasy through Madagascar, I mean from Madagascar to, uh, to Malaysia, Polynesia, Oceania and so forth, that body of people more or less plot out the Indian Ocean dispersion sphere that resulted from the defeat of these forces in the Arakarata War. So it's a primary event as far as setting up the dispersion of the nations from the, uh, from the heartland of Mesopotamia. <clears throat> anyway, reconstructions of that kind in which one takes the data of Sumerology and especially such an event as the Arakarata War and plots it into the political context, the political flow of events that you see in Genesis 9 through 11. And then another dimension of this reconstruction, number 11, third millennium focus. As a result of taking the first chronological step of the 5 and 11, taking it face value, the flood occurs in the third millennium. There's nowhere else for it to go. It occurs in the center, the heart of the third millennium. And therefore recognize that all of the literate post-Diluvian history of Mesopotamia and Egypt in the third millennium BC belongs to the post-Diluvian lifetime of Shem and realize that equations between Genesis 10, if we get that, the entire second half of the third millennium BC is the lifetime of Shem. And so the entire political history of Mesopotamia and Egypt and the rest of it in that period is all within one single biblical lifetime. And that leads to a certain result. Realize that equations between Genesis 10 and 11 patriarchs, the ones literally named in the text of Genesis 10 and 11, and early monarchs in the king lists and so forth, the dynastic lists of Egypt and Mesopotamia, are the rule, not the exception. Meaning there's nothing particularly spectacular about that suggestion that Ebrium of Ebla might be Eber of Genesis 11. That's not the exception, that's the rule. That these patriarchs named in Genesis 11, Genesis 10, are the, are the original ruling class of the human race. And you expect to find them, and you expect to find them through these multiple careers, that is the same patriarchs turning up under different names in different 30-year segments of early post diluvian history in different locations. These are international feudal aristocrats, and they are highly ubiquitous, highly empowered, and highly unique, divinely unique because of these very, very great longevities that cause Shem to live into his own 16th generation. <clears throat> the 12th point, dispensationalism. Note the political and spiritual accuracy of the dispensational distinction between the antediluvian and postdiluvian ages. There was a vast degree of difference, a difference of quality, a difference of empowerment between the antediluvian world and the postdiluvian world. The antediluvians had certain genetic advantages, but in all other respects, they were a barbaric people. They were truly barbaric, primitive, savage. They were not, they did not have the gift and that leads me to the 13th point, empowerment. Recognize that Gentile nations came into existence after the flood through a spiritual gift presuppositional for the status quo of Romans 13, 1, the powers that be are of God. You don't talk about powers that are before the flood. You don't talk about Gentile nations before the flood. The gift was absent. God left man to himself. The end of all flesh came before him because all you had before the flood was all flesh that this gift that created the status quo of Romans 13.1, a gift recognized by the Sumerians in the term kingship, which is in the early part of the text of the Eastern King List, kingship by the Egyptians as the Ka, that uh, hieroglyphic sign of the Egyptians of a man holding his hands uh, up at either side of his head, which is a posture duplicated by the male figures on the outside of the Gundestrup cauldron of the Celts, that signifies the power, the gift of God by which Pharaoh becomes Pharaoh, the Ka. And then even the Romans have a version of it, the Ganius, from which we get our word genius. I think they, there was a Ganius of the, again, the emperors. Just as the Pharaoh became Pharaoh through the Ka, the emperor becomes emperor through the Ganius. Realize that the antediluvian order, world before the flood, in the absence of this gift, was truly barbaric and that literate civilization, that's where I draw the line. We know from early Genesis that there was metal working before the flood. There was some kind of cities, uh, gatherings together. What appears to me to be completely absent from the antediluvian world 
is literature, writing. And the type of historicity that comes with that divine gift of literature. I can't be absolutely dogmatic about it, but for the most part, when you're talking about Stone Age man and all of these finds, you're talking about antediluvian man. Who, uh, and that, that means illiterate man. And because illiterate, ahistorical, ungentile, natural, all flesh, unempowered to create history. So that's the idea. The, after the flood, you get literature, you get historicity, you get politics as we know it, and you take a giant stride toward uh, the eternal consummation of all things in the New Jerusalem after the flood. The 14th point is imperialism. The fact that empire is there in embryo from the very beginning because of this international feudal aristocracy of Noah's family. That, that in itself is, a, is an empire, but you don't have a populace to form a single colony, much less a nation, much less a, an empire. But empire is, is there in, in, uh, in prototype or in embryo. I read imperialism, number 14, recognized that the messianic line of Genesis 11, and probably the messianic line of all parts of Scripture, uh, toward the beginning, was actually a dynastic line of universal empire, and that Noah's family created such an empire, the instant world population enabled this ideal to be realized. Now here is a place where um, democratic bias, the democratic prejudice, has eclipsed the significance of the genealogy of Genesis 11. Uh, the genealogy of Genesis 5 belongs to the antediluvian world, and for the reason just stated, nations were not being formed, literature wasn't there, and so you can say that there's a certain domestic and even democratic humility about the patriarchs of Genesis 5 in that nations haven't come yet. Later, you trace the messianic line down through the uh, family of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in that case, we all know that Israel was a very small nation because it was called into existence later. It was a kind of counter world, but it was a much smaller counter world. And so there's a, uh, the lack of something like uh, empire simply because you're working with a very small nation. So we look at the messianic line in the abstract, both before the flood and after the call of Abraham, and we get the impression of humility, small scale, small potatoes, so to speak, in terms of the mess uh, messianic claims. It is not till we get to the Christian revelation and the final member of the messianic line is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He finally, we see him in humility in his earthly first advent. And we tend to connect that humility of his in his first advent, the fact he humbles himself to the cross, and we associate that with this democratic domestic humility that we see in the version of the messianic line before the flood and after Abraham. And we sort of conclude that the whole idea of a messianic line is some sort of an abstract thing known only to God, subsisting among people living in tents and, and, and munching on uh, lamb bones or something. And we, we have a humble vision of the whole idea of the Messiah. And it's not until we take the return of Christ seriously and the setting up of the millennial kingdom seriously that we really see what's going on in that strip of the messianic line that is in Genesis 11 between the flood and the call of Abraham. What we have there is the formation, not only of nations, but of the entire articulation of nations, that is, empires, such as we see in the Akkadian Empire. So it's at that point that you have imperial implications. Now, the problem with the earliest names after Noah, Noah, Shem, Arphaxad I, Shelah, Eber, and Peleg, the problem with them is that they are coming so early that world population is not great enough even to establish a colony, much less a nation, but you start through the geometric ratio, working up a tremendously high world population from Peleg's generation forward. And that's exactly when you get what? The historic Akkadian Empire. And therefore that leads to the next point, the Akkadian Empire, number 15. Equate three members of the line below Peleg with three members of the Akkadian Imperial uh, Dynasty. And to be specific, I'll, I'll name them. Peleg's son, Ru, is the founding founder of the Akkadian Empire, Sargon of Agade, Sargon of Agdu, uh, Akkad, Akkad being the capital zone, the center of Mesopotamia, Babylonia proper. And uh, these were a Semitic-speaking people, and that would confirm the association between Semitic-speaking people and Abraham himself. Although eventually Abraham adopts the language of Canaan, which is Western Semitic, and that's different from the Eastern Semitic that is in the Akkadian Empire still. It's, it's in the Semitic world. So Ru, the founder of the Akkadian Empire is, excuse me, that uh, Sargon, the founder of the 
Akkadian Empire is uh, Ru on the main Shemite line or the Messianic line of Genesis 11. Ru's son, Sarug, is the one of the other, one of the next, one of his sons, Manish Tushu, whom L.A. Waddell accurately identifies as many as the first dynastic pharaoh of Egypt, and there's that international imperial perspective going into effect in that particular writer, who was sadly enough a Nordic supremacist and anti-biblicist, but at least he had the wisdom to recognize that Menes, the first pharaoh of Egypt, was the same person as Manish Tushu, defying uh, chronological schemes to the contrary. And this is the Genesis 10 patriarch, Sarag, which means the branch, and that would explain the name. It's the branch because it's, it's at this point that what had been a Mesopotamian cosmos becomes partly an Egyptian cosmos. It branches out into Egypt, and because it begins in Upper Egypt, the Menes and that particular dynasty number one was established in Upper Egypt. We're approaching from the angle of the Lower Sea around Arabia, and uh, as, as I understand it, Manish Tushu had to do with Arabia as well. So in other words, it's a Lower Sea development connecting uh, the Akkadian Empire with Upper Egypt. Actually, in my judgment, the Noah's family, the universal family, had been in Egypt for 60 years just prior to the sin of Ham. But they weren't forming colonies, they were just migrating, and that's another point that I make below. So the Akkadian Empire, the last one then, Naram, Sa Naram Sin, the warlord, who was devoted to the Sin cult, that is the moon cult of Abraham's birthplace, Ur, Sumerian Ur, Ur the Chaldees, then uh, this is the third of these Akkadian emperor, empires, emperors. It's even possible that another one of them, Shark al Ashari, is Abraham's father, Terah. But I'm not quite as certain as the, of that, but I'm, I'm much more certain of the fact that, that empire begins, and this is where it begins, and that's the reason why the Messianic line is there, to show where imperial uh, privilege was concentrated, owing to the privileges that, uh, that Shem acquired from, really, the curse on Canaan that could not be revoked. And uh, so we uh, apply the name Shem to the Semitic linguistic sock of the Akkadians to actually link of the imperial line of Genesis 11 with the people who rule in the Akkadian Empire. Sixteenth point, eternal perspective. Generally speaking, perceive the reality of design, order, and symmetry in all underlying matters pertaining to the Gentile cosmos and associate these principles with the eternal kingdom of heaven as reflected in the church, in the future millennial kingdom, and in the eternal polis, city that is, of the New Jerusalem, which is quite a city because it's associated with kings, and with nations in its final setting in Revelation 21. Then the Gentile cosmos is a spiritually vitiated version of the kingdom of heaven as formed prematurely apart from the sacred history of Israel. The idea of the Gentile cosmos as a vitiated version of the kingdom of heaven, that's almost a truism because you've got the entire human community in eight people. They are set apart or holy at first and they set about to form an order after the flood. And so by definition, that order would be the nearest appro approximation to the kingdom of heaven in that day. So the only issue there is whether or not the concept of the kingdom of heaven was operative throughout history or was not operative throughout history, and I believe that it certainly was. But obviously this is a vitiated version of the kingdom of heaven, and the very presumptuousness of the Tower of Babel scheme and the rest of it shows how it was being vitiated. It was vitiated by idolatry. It was vitiated by the sin of Ham. It was vitiated by the rebellion of the Hamite family against Noah. It was vitiated by the demotion of Noah. So we see it's vitiated, but nevertheless, it is a kind of version of the kingdom of heaven in its time. And uh, therefore, we should see order. And of course, the word cosmos does connote order, design. So it is a design, but it's a design with spiritual evil uh, infiltrating it. The last two points, 17 and 18. The 17th point, dynamism. Here again is where the power issue that I raised early on side A comes back to haunt the study of the early post-Diluvian world. Efforts to study this family of Noah without attributing tremendous dynamism to these people who lived for a very long time, not to grow long beards and get sick like the Strolbrugs, but they lived for a long time because they were exceedingly healthy, and that health was a premise for an extremely dynamic mode of life. Dynamism in Noah's family. Realize that Noah's family were in constant migration throughout the Middle East in the first century and a half after the flood, when world population was insufficient to establish fixed colonies. They were itinerant. They were on the move. You could call them nomadic, except that that has plebeian implications that aren't appropriate. They were mapping out the geographic cosmos that their descendants would later inhabit. They were establishing 
centers upon which cities were built. And the best proof of it is the gnomes of the Nile. We don't know what the gnomes of the Nile are. They're districts into which the great cities of Egypt were later built. They're pre-urban centers. Now, who put those pre-urban centers there? Well, I'm suggesting to you this very dynamic family in a period of time in which they were on the Nile. Later traditions, such as the Amorite kings who dwelled in tents, that suggests a certain nomadic dynamism, or the maritime career, which L.A. Waddell attributes to Menes Manishtushu, whom he traces not only around the lower sea, but in the upper sea as well, to Western Europe, that kind of dynamism typifies an overwhelmingly dynamic early post-Diluvian culture consistent with the quasi-divine aristocracy of the universal family. The early post-Diluvian world was the supreme renaissance of human experience to be matched only by the dynamism and creative enterprise of Christ's second advent. And I can only say that there are some real problems on the part of Christian people. First of all, there are many Christian people who do not believe in the pre-mill perception. And there are many other Christians who are pre-mill, but who haven't thought through the implications of pre-mill. There are people who still talk about going to heaven as though we go up without coming back down again. Somehow the idea of returning with Christ just hasn't grasped the inner logical resources of a lot of Christian people. Well, if you do, if you let the pre-mill perception dictate a worldview and do so more or less in defiance of certain democratic sentimental attitudes toward going to be with loved ones in heaven and just sort of staying there and treating heaven as though it's somehow like the, like the farm or something that one retires to, that if you bring the, if you understand the political destiny of redeemed man, that the New Jerusalem, even beyond the millennium, is a polis, a city, a political entity, and you understand then the dynamism of the return, and why connect the return with the time of the flood? Obviously, in the Olivet Discourse, Christ says, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, meaning that the present age, just before the return, is like the dismal antediluvian world, the drowned rat world, but that the world after the Christ's return is analogous to the early post-diluvian world. So, it, so Noah's family become types of early millennial man and of this elite aristocratic group of resurrected men returning with Christ out of heaven of whom he's the chief. He's resurrected already and he'll be resurrected when he comes back to earth. So resurrection man will be walking earth, ruling over an underclass of mortals, both redeemed Jews and Gentiles who have not been raised from the dead yet because we know that there's genetic mortal activity that goes on in the millennial kingdom. So if you get that whole picture, that aristocratic picture of aristocratic resurrected saints coming out of heaven going to earth, then you see the significance, the typological significance of Noah's family after the flood, and you can conceptualize them clearly. Otherwise, if there's uh, static on the line, and if either one is amill or post-mill or whatever, and doesn't understand that resurrection man plays a role in establishing world civilization for a thousand years uh, after the return, and if you don't have a return concept, and if that concept hasn't gripped your own conception of your own future as a, as a believer, uh, if you sentimentalize that type of dynamism out of your prospect for the future, the result then is that the type of dynamism that one must see in Noah's family doesn't register, and so Noah's family doesn't register, and this international imperial aristocracy doesn't register, and the itinerant movement of Noah's family after the flood doesn't register, and the maritime uh, imperial activities of Manish Tushu Menes doesn't register, and the internationalism of the Genesis 10 patriarchs doesn't register, and none of this registers. So the whole thing rests on not only pre-mill, but internalized pre-mill, in which you have that, I guess it's what Coleridge calls the gift of imagination, the creative power and the finite just to realize the real. It's not a matter of dreaming up something that doesn't exist. It's a matter of conceptualizing something that does exist. And I've just, that's the point I've just made. There's a pre-mill reality that many Christians, some Christians, of course, for traditional reasons, reject it. They reject the doctrine. But there's also the inability to grasp the dynamic grandeur of the pre-mill model of the future of world history. And because that isn't being grasped, the parallel to it, the typological parallel to it, which is the survival of Noah's family after the flood to carry out this grand enterprise of creating a world of nations, that doesn't register. The dynamism of it doesn't re register. The internationalism of it doesn't register. And you just have old home week in the farm, and you have Noah and his family stuck somewhere in Syria, and you put Ur the Chaldees in Syria rather than down in Sumer, 
and you got the Gentiles totally independent of the Bible and you inflate the chronologies and all kinds of things happen as a result of the inability to grasp power, power, power. You see that? It's a very simple. Power isn't there in the high chronologies. Power isn't there in the Amel scheme that doesn't recognize that resurrection man is a historical agency. Power doesn't e exist in the conceptualizing of the high longevities. You see these as old men living in a tent and dying like the Strolbrugs and just not dying. Power doesn't exist here, it doesn't exist there. Power doesn't exist in reading Psalm 82. If someone tries to explain away the human gods as though they weren't real. Power is missing here, power is missing there, power is missing over here, all over the place. The element of power is not there, and why isn't it there? Because concentrated power is contrary to the democratic worldview, so I turn back to this first point, purge your mind of democracy or this subject will never be grasped. It can't be understood. You've got to learn to love Pope Gregory the Seventh, and I say that even though I'm not a Catholic. You've got to lo learn to love the idea of concentrated power, despotism. Remember that Jesus, we use that as a negative word, don't we? Despotism, how evil despotism. Jesus himself is referred to as the despotes, the only master. And democratic man at the end of the age are in Jude, where Jude says that they deny the only, the only master, the monus despotes, that is the only, the only master. So they won't have this concentrated power ideal. And the result is they have constructed a democratized worldview that cannot handle short chronology at points of origin, cannot handle the powers unleashed in a great renaissance phenomenon such as the early post-Diluvian world of Noah's family. The 18th and last point is just a statement on sources. And that again is a kind of presupposition because when you pick one source and focus on it rather than another, it operates with the logical force of a presupposition. Some key sources of design have been as follows. Tetrad systems in Genesis 2, 4, 5, and 6, the Fulker Toffel of Genesis 10, the genealogy of Genesis 11, so three focal points uh, for a sense of design, especially in tetrad systems, of which there are many. The four rivers of Genesis 2, the fourfold breakdown of the first four males, Adam, Seth, Cain, and Abel, and handled systematically in the, in the, the chapters 4 and 5 of Genesis. Genesis 6, where you have four male survivors of the flood, and logically speaking, four female survivors. And then later in Genesis 8, you have four seasons. So there are a lot of tetrads. And then in Genesis 10 itself, you have the four sons of Javan and the four sons of uh, Ham. And then the genealogy of Genesis 11, for reasons already stated. Then other sources, extra-biblical, Sumerian urban cult center, uh, cult, cult system. Thorkel Jakobsen's uh, distribution of the different... Uh, uh, one city, one God, a one dominant God principle. So you have this systematic high pantheon spread out through the various cities of Sumer. The 42 gnomes of the Nile, which I've already mentioned as, as having primary value, showing the designing work. Now these uh, 42 gnomes, to me, they're just, just annual camps. And the same thing you see, that is, as the family of Noah worked their way up the Nile River, that is southward, uh, from, the, from lower Egypt to upper Egypt, they established... Uh, annual camp locations that become the nuclei for the 42 gnomes of the Nile, districts of the Nile. And that same principle was at work in other parts, in Mesopotamia, Syrian Mesopotamia, coming down out of Mount Ararat at the, at the beginning, so that you have this uh, a, a map, a prehistoric map being formed by Noah's family after their survival of the flood. Another major source uh, is the Sumerian king list of Eason. I've already mentioned that. A lot of names organized into dynasties that represent segments of early... The First Kish dynasty, again, the error yesterday, the First Kish dynasty runs from the 180th to the, 100, to the 210th year. The Sumerian flood, like the Chinese flood, is really the Tower of Babel incident, which is not being confessed openly. Then you have the opening 77 lines of the Babylonian Marduk epic, which I've already mentioned. You have various genealogical segments of the Hellenic and other pantheons. The Hellenic pantheon is very, very synthetic. You have duplicate versions of the same patriarchs over and over again. The dominant line in the Hellenic scheme is the Hamitic, Hamite. And finally, the pictorial imagery of the Celtic Gundestrup cauldron. And there, if there's a bias at all, the Celtic bias is Japhetic. Uh, there's a strong link between Japhetic, uh, that is Celtic origins, and the Japhethites, the family of Japheth, just as there's a very strong link between Hellenic origins
and the Hamites. And there are other parallels of that sort. Now, actually, in world ethnology, too much attention has been given to the triad of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The actual formation of the nations was based on an octad or ogdoad. The eight survivors of the flood all have a hand in forming the nations. And the linguistic stocks are not triune. It's not, you know, the Semitic stock versus some Hamitic stock.